Captain George Vancouver, commander of his Britannic Majesty ships Discovery and Chatham, sailed through the entrance to Vancouver's harbor on the 13th day of June, 1792. Today, Vancouver is located where the gallant navigator found safe anchorage over 170 years ago. Built on the shores of Burrard Inlet, the city has one of the finest natural harbors in the world, and its magnificent setting inspired Captain Vancouver to observe. To render it a most lovely land requires only the industry and ingenuity of man. Except for a tragic fire which destroyed most of the city in 1886, its history has been one of vitality and amazing growth, and today the industry and ingenuity of man is reflected in Vancouver's apartments, drives, parks, and homes. Industry has contributed its measure to Vancouver's strength and design. Modern roads, bridges, tunnels, and freeways connect expanding local and suburban districts with the heart of the city. Like other Canadian cities, Vancouver is a vigorous social and industrial complex which must adapt to the constantly changing pressures of population and growth. New and larger industrial plants, hospitals, apartments and offices make Vancouver's ever-changing skyline a symbol of its civic progress. Blight is death to a city. And these dwellings, built with such hope and care at the turn of the century, are dying board by board, and the property they occupy dies with them. Most of Vancouver is kept strong and healthy through the normal process of land and building renewal. But in areas such as this, nothing happens except dilapidation and decay gets worse each year. Property values fall and blight is the result. What does this condition mean to a city in terms of its physical and human resources, its health and crime rate? What does it cost to police this area, to provide social assistance, fire protection, and water are sufficient taxes collected from this area to pay for these services? How is this worn out area to be renewed? The answers to these and many other questions were not known, but it was clear that unless positive action was taken, the problem of blight would never be solved. To finance a comprehensive study of the blighted area, the city applied to Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation for a federal grant under the National Housing Act. Upon receipt of the grant, the city conducted a detailed study of the blighted areas. A housing committee was formed with representatives from Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation, the province, and the city, bringing together the housing experts of the three levels of government. To measure the extent of the decay, the city planners considered three primary factors. First, age of dwelling. Second, quality of housing, as shown by its exterior condition. And third, existing land use. To determine the quality of housing, Specially trained personnel appraised it by making an external survey. This provided information on structural condition and likely deterioration over the next 20 years. The survey revealed that the distribution of blight was most prevalent in the areas containing the oldest housing. When completed, the survey disclosed a widespread pattern of confused and mixed land uses, derelict buildings, ramshackle wooden tenements, and dilapidated houses. 
but areas such as these are not composed of buildings alone. Over 25,000 people live in these dwellings. To measure the social factors, a second survey was conducted by making an internal inspection of every fourth house within the blighted area. To acquaint householders with the purpose of the survey, information letters from the mayor were mailed to every householder to be interviewed. Chinese inhabitants of the area were advised by a special notice in Cantonese. Letters were timed to arrive a day or two before the enumerator called. The information required for an impersonal but necessary set of statistics emerged from each interview. I got sick. TB, you know. I got this cold, the dampness and everything. The incidence of active tuberculosis in these areas is 642 per 100,000 against a citywide average of 231. 16% of the houses checked had damp walls and floors. Neighborhood good. Good people, you know. House too small, too small. 15% of the houses were overcrowded. While the area contains only 5% of Vancouver's population, it houses 14% of the city's old age pensioners and 20% of families on social assistance. I like chopping wood. Stove don't heat the house good though. 20% of the dwellings lack adequate means of heating. I just plugged in the heater and the room was full of flames. The wiring's just rotten. Overloaded, inadequate, and outdated electrical wiring makes hundreds of these dwellings dangerous fire traps. The plumbing's worn out, and I have to do my washing here. These taps work. 10% had no bath. 17% of the toilets were shared by six or more persons. 10% had cold water only. As the internal survey continued, the tragedy of decay and its economic and social impact was firmly established. The evidence soon revealed that specific areas were suffering from excessive decay, and because of its effect on the city's future, it was decided to launch a 20-year redevelopment program. This program would be phased into Vancouver's overall 20-year development plan. While poor housing and improper land use exists in various parts of the city, this condition predominates in the oldest districts. The external and internal surveys revealed two areas of extreme decay, which form a destructive band of blight around the city center. Two areas were selected for immediate attention. And in the largest of these, Vancouver's redevelopment program was set in motion. McLean Park Playground was the key to the plan, as it was the only clear land available in the area. Stage one of the plan called for construction of a high-rise apartment and a group of masonettes on the McLean Park grounds. These buildings will provide a bank of housing for people who live in the adjacent blocks of older dwellings marked for future demolition. As soon as a block is cleared of blighted buildings, more apartments and masonettes will be constructed, thereby keeping the supply of housing ahead of the needs created by demolition and land clearance. Through the continued acquisition of land, plus private and public construction, the redevelopment program will be repeated block by block until the entire district becomes a healthy and economically stable part of the city. New parks, schools, Industrial, commercial, and residential buildings will add their measure of beauty and strength to Vancouver through the planned demolition of the old. The cost of acquiring and clearing land over the next 20 years is estimated to be over $75 million. To start the redevelopment, Vancouver's voters approved an expenditure of $3 million over a five-year period. For this phase, half the cost was borne by the federal government and half was shared equally by the province and the city. Prior to land clearance, construction began at McLean Park.
To ensure an ample supply of housing for the families concerned, a second public housing project, Skeena Terrace, was started outside the redevelopment area. Its purpose was to augment McLean Park by providing low rental housing for Vancouver citizens and to absorb any overflow from the land clearance program. Both projects were financed jointly by the federal government and the province of British Columbia. With the completion of McLean Park and Skeena Terrace, the first important step in Vancouver's redevelopment program was realized. Young and senior citizens have obtained low-rent housing with dignified surroundings and a healthy environment. The problem of blight cannot be solved by civic governments alone. It requires the sustained interest, cooperation and encouragement of all citizens. Without this support, Vancouver could not have initiated a plan to renew its aging districts or build modern housing. With the interest of their citizens, other cities in Canada have instituted far-reaching programs to renew decaying districts and to construct low rental housing similar to Skeena Terrace and McLean Park. With the completion of the initial stage of Vancouver's redevelopment program, the big day arrives. The first group of householders and tenants move out of their dilapidated dwellings to take up residence in the new housing at McLean Park and Skeena Terrace. The National Housing Act provides assistance to acquire and clear blighted areas and construct low rental housing in partnership with provincial governments. With this assistance and a sound plan capable of adjusting to changing conditions, Vancouver prepares for the future. Children can play and grow up in a clean and happy atmosphere, conditions essential to the development of personal and civic pride. The pressures of population, the demands of expanding industry, and the ravages of time create difficult and perplexing problems for all civic governments. But with confidence, Vancouver has accepted the challenge, knowing that to build a better city requires only the industry and ingenuity of man. <laughs> 